Craig, I'm sorry, it's important we look at the facts. Why? Why? Douglas Ross is sounding pretty scared. I believe in independence. And he clapped like a seal. Hi there, and welcome to another edition of Planet Hollywood. I'm Paul Hutchin, political editor of the Daily Record. Joining me this week are Hannah Roger, chief reporter of the Sunday Mail, and Scottish Daily Express editor Ben Borland. So Holyrood is in recess for a couple of months, which means that Parliament is not sitting, but Scottish politics never sleeps, it's never dull, and there's plenty going on. There's also been a lot of activity near Holyrood this week, given that the King is in town for post-coronation celebrations. Um, he was in Edinburgh with the Queen in order to be presented with the nation's crown jewels. Now, I don't want to focus too much on that event, it went according to plan and, and these things happen, but I am interested in discussing with my guests the role of the monarchy in 21st century Scotland and whether it still has a place. Um, so just starting with you, Ben, obviously the Scottish Daily Express is a big supporter of the institution of monarchy. Do you think that Prince Charles is sort of leading an institution that is in root health north of the border, or do you think there are maybe signs of concern for him? Um, I don't think there are any signs of concern in Scotland particularly. I think he's um, probably exceeded expectations in his in his early months on the throne. Obviously, um, the, the late Queen passed away in Balmoral um, last September, and I think the outpouring of emotion and uh, just the incredible scenes we witnessed in the following days showed how much affection and you know what what esteem uh, both the late Queen Elizabeth and the royal family and the institution of the monarchy are, are held in Scotland. You know when push comes to shove, the whole country turned out to 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 uh, pay tribute. I think Charles has got off to a good start. Um, certainly. Yesterday's events were on a much less lavish scale than the coronation itself. So perhaps, you know, if, if there were some concerns about the amount that was spent during a cost of living crisis, I don't think you could really levy that criticism at uh, the, the Scottish events this week. But, but even so, they've been very well supported. I think there's been a healthy protest um, there's also been people who've made it very clear that, that they are fully in support of the monarchy. Um, the Not My King signs that, that we see here, you know, the bright yellow, the very, very eye-catching, but they, they were very much a minority on the Royal Mile. Um, the, the when you talk about the popularity of the monarchy, though, is that is that not because of the late Queen rather than the institution itself? I think the two go hand in hand. I think, as I say, I think Charles has has, has started very well. He's, you know, he's. I think we all know where he stands. We all know where he stands on the environment, and uh, we all know where he stands on on these kind of issues. I think a few people made the point that the Greens uh, were, were protesting at the foot of the Royal Mile, whereas in actual fact, King Charles has achieved far more for the environment than the Scottish Greens. I mean, by just a, a considerable distance. He's, he's very right. much a, a, a green king, I think, as the record called him today. Just to bring you in, Hannah, I mean, there are problems for the monarchy. You look at the, the tensions with Prince Harry um, and Meghan, and then you've got Andrew and some of his questionable decisions. And, of course, it is a hereditary institution which will inevitably jar with quite a lot of people. I mean, how would you assess the state of the institution in 2023? Um, well, I was looking at some polling to do with, you know, favourability of the monarchy in Scotland, and certainly you can see quite clearly that support for the monarchy has fallen not hugely, but there has been a, a fall. I think it was around 50% of people kind of were broadly supportive of the monarchy 
before the queen died and then after that i think it's gone down to about 46 percent or something like that so you know i think the queen was sort of one of a kind not just because she's the queen but you know she was there for so long she was kind of just a known figure and i hate to use the phrase sort of national treasure but in the case of the queen she was um whereas i think with charles people don't really re relate to him as much um you know so i think that maybe explains some of the the polling and the sort of just people's lack of connection to him um but certainly you know i do think as well in scotland we do have that um the royal family it doesn't seem as close to us as maybe mm -hmm. some people in for example london or the south of england certainly um even though there are you know royal residences and things up here but even so during the coronation um the number of sort of street parties and things that were planned down south uh compared to the number of applications that had gone in in scotland it was really really low so i don't know i mean I just think we've got a different relationship with with the the monarchy than you know than other well than England I guess I'm not entirely sure how Wales and Northern Ireland view it but certainly in Scotland it's quite different. Do you not think that Hannah sticking with you? Do you not think the concept of a hereditary monarch, hereditary head of state, it just looks a bit weird in 2023? I mean, if we're going to go down that route, there's a lot of things that look kind of weird in 2023, but, you know, it's just them's the breaks. That's the way it is. Um, I do think one thing that looks weird is the fact that Lorna Slater uh, seemed, correct me if I'm wrong, but she seemed quite keen to attend the actual coordination. No? Yeah, I mean, I don't know, maybe a few in both camps. <laughs> Well, do you know? What, but do you know what I mean, though? I mean, why, why, like, why is she attending that, but then protesting against? It's just a bit doesn't really sit right with me. Whereas at least you know Patrick Harvey, you know where he stands on it. He's always been very anti-monarchy, but from you know from uh, conversations that I've had with some people who shall not be named, uh, she was very enthusiastic about attending the coronation. So. Yeah, we'll leave it at that. And Ben, Ben, just to pick up with you, um, you know, supporters of monarchy always say that it's a politically impartial institution, that they don't um, get involved in party politics and they're, they're essentially above the fray. But as you were saying, Prince Charles is known for his commitment to uh, environmentalism, to, to multi-faith uh, initiatives, to helping uh, minority ethnic communities. Is there a bit more scope for him to to, to dabble in politics than, than his late mum? I think so. I think um, obviously it's politically neutral. I think what what he mustn't do is try and interfere with you know the the lawmaking process at Parliament at, at the UK Parliament or the Scottish Parliament. But the Queen was. Uh, famous for never expressing a view on things. She, she was the ultimate fence sitter. I think maybe we can all accept that Charles, it would be crazy after so many decades where we all know his view on things for him suddenly to try and hide that view. So I think if he, you know, if he's expressing a view on, on the things that he cares passionately about, I, I, I think we can, I think we can live with that. Isn't there a double standard there, though? I mean, Prince Harry is committed to environmentalism. He's shown a commitment to climate change-related issues. He gets hammered for it, but folk are relaxed about his dad doing it. I think the thing with Harry is that both he and his wife um, say they're committed to environmental issues but seem very, very keen on private jet travel. Um I know. Prince Charles travels by plane as well, though, doesn't he? Uh, usually royal train, come down. Um, but, I mean, he goes sure. abroad, so he goes abroad. So he well, then he, he's, he's the head of state, you know. Harry has left the royal family 
or he's left frontline royal duties. I mean, I, I don't know. I don't really. I, I think the, the monarchy itself, and just to go back to a point Hannah made. Obviously, we've been covering these stories for for years and years and years, and and the the street parties issue go, goes back as long as I've been a reporter in Scotland, um, right back to the Queen, back to the. Um, you know, the, the Diamond Jubilee, there's never been that kind of street party um, enthusiasm. So so I don't think mm-hmm. the fact that there weren't many street parties at the coronation shows that Charles is any less popular than his mother. The, the, there's never been a lot of street parties, even no, though well, it's like absolute ha- height. I think it's just a different way that, a different relationship. Scotland's a bit more relaxed. It's a bit more hands, Aye, I think hands that's off why the monarchy. I think that's what I meant. You know, I, I'm not saying deliberately people were not supporting oh, the king's no, 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 no. but you know, I do think like in Scotland we just that. I mean, we don't tend to do these street party things for anything. <laughs> really, we just all choose to go down I the pub. To say, we had one on our street for the platinum jubilee last summer. Mm. Um, about everyone dragged their barbecues out onto the front lawn. Even a few guys, you know, Celtic fans on the street, they were sort of joining in with a kind of wry smile and, and everyone seemed to just enjoy it, you know. The, and I think this is it. You've just got to bump along together. Someone played, someone brought an, an instrument out and, and, and played Rule Britannia and a few people booed and a few others applauded. Mm. And, you know, this is 20, we've all just got to get along together. And I think, you know, if, if, if we're just discussing the, the institution of monarchy, it always comes back to the same question. If we don't have the royal family, who do we have instead? Mm. I mean, an elected head of state? Who, yeah, well... Who would that be? Tony Blair? I Nicola mean, Sturgeon? Nicola Sturgeon. Well, I mean, an, an independent... Sco- I mean, mm. this is the other thing. The monarchy's going nowhere as long as Scotland is part of the United Kingdom. Mm. It's only a question if. Well, yeah, but even on even on the happens. yeah even on the question though of independence, so there's people because I, when I was looking at all the polling, there is obviously the question of if Scotland was an independent country, would you favour the monarchy or an elected head of state or you don't know? And I think forty one percent the last poll forty one percent said they would keep the monarchy, forty percent said elected head of state. And the rest of them said they don't know. So it's quite interesting, isn't it? The sort of yeah, there's not necessarily that connection between independence and being anti-monarchy. No, you know? no, so, true. Well, well that, I mean, that was the SNP's. Well, that is the SNP's position. Mm, Certainly, yeah. Alex Hammond's position, although he seems mm. to have forgotten that he was the monarchy's biggest fan in Scotland. No. Yeah, he was. I remember oh. actually Paul um, when he was at the Sunday Herald did. Um, quite a few stories on the the correspondence between him and uh, Prince Charles at the time. Yes, yes, yeah, absolutely. One of the things, though, see, one of the things I did actually a point that I did want to make, right? See, you know, you're talking about oh the royal family and their the Queen was very neutral and Charles, we know Charles's views, right? I think that's a fair point. There's no point in him now pretending that he doesn't have any opinions, but. So I was watching that documentary about Boris and Lord Lebedev. Is it? Yeah, Evgeny Lebedev. And um, it was saying how there was all these concerns about him going into the House of Lords and the security services were so concerned about it that I think they took this sort of unprecedented step of actually trying to appeal to the Queen to get him, to get her to block the... uh, you know, the entry into the House of Lords. And she, even though there was like all this massive, you know, national security issues, she said, no, I'm not getting involved. So when you look at that, obviously the Queen has got a history of not getting involved in anything. So you can say, well, that's fair enough. But when you've got somebody like Charles who's expressing opinions and getting involved in certain issues, then I fear fear that he might be then expected to get involved in other more serious issues and he would open himself up to criticism if he didn't. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Totally. So, yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a fine line that you have to walk on that. Um, and I'm not sure what that line is for him. 
Um, mm-hmm. Let's just move on to the SNP and their latest brilliant week. Um, the Westminster Group, Mary Black, the deputy leader at Westminster, announced she would be standing down at the mm-hmm. next general election. And then that was followed by a pretty ugly spat between the SNP MP Angus McNeil and the chief whip Brendan O'Hara, which led to Angus McNeil getting a temporary suspension. So, Hannah, I've said many times you used to do the the Westminster beat for the Herald. You Mm -hmm. know many people. What's your assessment of the the latest round in this civil war? Uh, Well, Angus McNeil is um, a well-known agitator. So... I think it's not surprising. And, you know, he's not hes not the sort of SNP establishment. He's not the biggest fan. He was always very outspoken. He has been outspoken about, you know, the stuff going on with Nicola Sturgeon. He called for her to be suspended while all the, you know, after she was arrested and then obviously released. So it's not surprising that he would be sort of agitating again. Um, yeah. And Brendan O'Hara, he can be, you know, he can be a bit, um, he's not shy of conflict as well. Uh, so I don't know, I don't know what the, what what he's tra- kind of seeking to gain from this. It could just be capitalising on the fact that Mary Black has decided that she's not going to stand again and he thinks, oh, it's a good time to kind of noise up the party in general. I don't really know what, what his aims are really. Um, I don't think he's a big fan of Stephen Flynn. Um, but yeah, Mary Black, I'm much more interested in what she had to say. Um, mm. You know, Westminster, I I could relate a lot to some of the things she was saying about toxicity and about the place in terms of how it operates. So nothing like, you know, take the politics out of it. It's a very, you know, claustrophobic environment. It's very unfamiliar like the way things work is is just completely backwards and I imagine for someone like Mary Black you know she was elected at the age of 20 she came down she was very sort of gung-ho and quite you know full of energy and and a bit of a sort of you know she was quite rebellious and things like that and I imagine in her head when she got elected she would want to come down and sort of shake things up and and make a difference and try and, you know, change things. And I think that she has probably felt really stifled in Westminster because you just can't come in, you know, you can't come in and start ripping up the rule book. It really doesn't work like that. I mean, we've seen what happened to Boris when he obviously tried to bend the rules and change the rules and do things, you know, it's, it's very frowned upon. And I think she's probably felt quite stifled by just the whole the whole thing. Um, that she sees a life outside of elected politics, Anna, or do you suspect that she's maybe got an eye on Hollywood at the next election? To be honest, no. I think I I think she this is just my personal I don't have any insight information. I I don't think that she would go back into politics but she we don't know because she might I think she needs a break from it basically by the time the next Holyrood election comes she might change her mind but I cannot see her going back into politics frontline politics straight away and um, I think she might be kind of slightly disillusioned by the whole thing um but it's a shame I think because she is She's, I think she's really talented. She's good at galvanising people and, and grabbing attention from the public, you know, with the way that she speaks and, and, you know, whether you agree with it or not, I think she is a very good, you know, speaker and she does say things, you know, quite bluntly, but in a way that makes sense and she gets people talking about it. So it, it's a shame, I think, because she, she was a good... She was a good sort of young politician in Scotland, so. Ben, I mean, the Westminster group is divided. The Holyrood group is divided. Um, the Yes movement is divided. Uh, I mean, the implosion of the SNP is quite a thing to watch over the, the, the last few months. How much do you think is caused by the fact that they, they realise that they've lost their way on independence and the thing that they're in politics to achieve 
is simply not going to happen in the short and medium term. And in that vacuum, they've decided to turn on themselves. I think uh, you've summed it up perfectly, Paul. Um, that's exactly what's happened. Um, uh, uh, you know, they're, they're a one-issue party. And if that one issue is now so far out of sight as to be unobtainable, um, what's left? Nothing. You know, straws in the wind. Um, I think the, the other uh, factor in all this is there's quite a few people looking ahead at um, the next election and worrying what's going to happen to, to their seat. I mean, Angus McNeil's won. Um, your former colleague, Torquil Crichton, looks like an excellent candidate for Labour in the Western Isles. I, I, I think most people would expect that, that he'll probably take that seat for Labour. It's always been a, a decent Labour stronghold. Angus McNeil's had it for years and years. And the one issue that you know, is absolutely burning out there are, are the ferries. And Angus Brendan never mentions them. I mean, he's got some crackpot idea about using Qatari money to build tunnels between the islands. But he never wades in on the CalMac issue. He never comes forward and says... You know, the Scottish government needs to get a grip of this company that, that they that they own. Um, he has he he seems to go over them on the fishing uh, side of things, isn't he? He has on the fishing, yeah, true. I, I mean, I guess he, you can't. It's just so unpopular. I, I just think that as well as the, 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 the fact that independence now looks, um, you know, a distant prospect, it, it's the much more... Uh, short-term prospect that's now looming large is is the next general election and clearly there's some MPs who've thought I'm going to jump before I lose my seat um, yeah. and, and fair play to them because they give up their loss of office payment I think there's quite a few SNP MPs who know full well they're going to lose their seat and will just coast into next September next October whenever it is and then pick up their, I think it's twice the, the, the statutory redundancy rate. So, so anyone who, who, who goes now, hats off to them because they're saving the public purse a few quid. Um, I just remember uh, the run-up to the 2014 independence referendum and how disciplined and united the SNP was. Um, they'd got the referendum, they thought they could secure independence and when you've got your eye on a prize like that it does sort of foster a sense of discipline now it's completely slipped from the radar no one knows what the strategy is no one accepts that uh, independence is going to happen in the next five years it's simply not and so you know, they are just they're, they're turning on each other and I, I really can't see it getting any better um, and just on that theme Hannah the latest opinion polls uh, again, looking good for Scottish Labour, certainly at a Westminster level. Um, uh, you know, if it was translated into uh, seats tomorrow in a general election, Labour would be a couple behind the SNP, and I think they'd be poised for power at Hollywood as well. So, um, happy days for for Sarwar as things stand. Well. Currently, yes. I mean, there's a poll. There's a poll that came out today. Um, however, there's been. I noticed there's been a little bit of kind of concern among some of the other posters about the accuracy of this individual um, polling organisation. I think it's quite an, a, a kind of new organisation, and it seems to have sort of quite, um, quite out outlying results for for some of the cases but they today i think they've they've kind of reported that a sort of very good result for labor but i think you know regardless of the individual minutiae of the polls i think it's obvious to almost everyone that that labor is going to do much better than they have been doing in scotland um but that is only if and i say this every time <laughs> That is only if they just 
keep plowing on, don't do anything stupid and, you know, uh, just keep doing what they're doing. However, Keir Starmer today, um, you know, I think we're probably going to talk about this a little bit more, but Keir Starmer today appears to be, I don't know, I, I don't know if he's maybe not had his coffee or what is going on, but he is now not committing to universal free school meals, which is bonkers, um, in my opinion, but also the the two child benefit cap, which you know led to the the so called rape clause, which is so controversial and despised by almost everyone up and down the country. He's saying that Labour may not get rid of that. You know, so it's these kind of things that they can't take they can't take any sort of victory for granted. And if they start fannying about, for want of a better word, with these sort of things that you would think, oh, that's a, a no-brainer, Labour will get rid of this and that. If they start messing about with it and going back and on stuff, they're going to turn away their core voters and, you know, it's going to end up in a mess. I mean, I'm flabbergasted by that two-child policy. I mean, just to, to go back, that was introduced by, I think, the Cameron Osborne government. It relates to various means-tested benefits um, for low-income families, and it does, as you say, lead to the rape clause, where um, if if a woman has been raped um, and wants uh, uh, benefits for, I think, a third child, she has to prove that she's been raped, which is just a horrendous disgusting. thing. Disgusting. So I have no idea why Labour would get themselves in a position where they would um, essentially back what was a nasty, horrible Conservative policy Ben, what, what, what are your thoughts on this? On the right clause or on well, Labour's on, uh, Starmer, Starmer basically, uh, it's come out today that Labour um, would probably keep the two-child limit on certain benefits. I mean, I think we've got to be careful with, with too much kind of emotive language uh, uh, around this. I don't think he's mentioned the, the, the right clause itself. The, the, the two child limit as as a policy if, if you can if you can find a way to to kind of remove um the, 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 this kind of thing that affects you know a, a terrible terrible thing that affects a, a, a small number of women if you, if you can take that out of it, the, the two child policy is is in itself you know perfectly defendable policy on on the use of public money um i think keir starmer probably recognizes that to win an election and i mean this is what's going to put him in difficulty in scotland because up here there is an alternative for people if if you're minded to vote labor um that there is an alternative in the snp and now that independence is off the table if you're slightly left of centre you, you, you can vote SNP safe in the knowledge that um, that, that, that you know the, the UK is safe um, and, and you're not voting Tory um, obviously there's the Lib Dems as well but I think down in England to win an election Keir Starmer needs to take votes from the Conservatives and, he, and he's got to how, how, how can you how can you um, defend a two child limit and also say that you're pro family? Surely, having children is a good thing. Bringing kids into the world is a good thing. Supporting children is a good thing. And then just an arbitrary limit on two kids. I mean, how is that justifiable? Well, I don't think you can say having children is a good thing. Well, okay. That's I mean, yeah, generally, generally, it is a good thing. It's it's good for society. You need to have a new generation well, of taxpayers. Um, yeah, but it's not like... It, it, it's because the whole, you know, to, th there isn't an unlimited pot of money. We, well, it seems we, to be we fair, can't, we can't just spend, the you know, the, the Treasury's reserves on, on, on unlimited benefits. There has to be. There has to be a cut-off. I mean, what would you do? Increase it to three kids? Two, two kids is, is the is the national average. I think is it two point four children? I'm sure there's a sitcom 
of that name. That that is. Well, I mean, you you see, there's you know there has to be limits. Of course, there's always limits in the benefit system. But you know, the, the previous prime minister found money to cut the top rate of tax. I think from 45 to 40 p. I mean, Cameron and Osborne, when they introduced the the two child limit, they also uh, doled out inheritance tax breaks. Um, well, exactly, I, and also if you look at all the the wastage. You know, the amount of frauds during the COVID pandemic, the amount of money that's given out in crony contracts, you know, the money that's wasted on um, countless things. You know, that bloody Boris Bridge that was clearly pie in the sky idea and it cost, you know, millions to actually for somebody to create a report that says this is a nonsense idea. I mean, if you cut all that nonsense and crap out of the way and actually put the money into policies that benefit normal working people, then you might be able to have a benefit cap that was for more than two children. And women who are, you know, raped don't have to go and show some faceless person in a benefits office that they've been raped to get benefits for their third child. I mean, it's, it's disgraceful. And the Tory government always seems to find money to shove in the pockets of their own supporters, funded by people at the bottom on means-tested benefits. That, that's, that's the way this government has functioned since 2010, Ben. Well, well, exactly. And the government has functioned since 2010 and, and won, what, three elections. Keir Starmer, and, you know, I, I'm not saying that I, I want this outcome to happen, but if Keir Starmer wants to be prime minister, he has to win a general election. And to win a general election... It, it, it needs policies that, that appeal to the most number of people. And no matter how much people may criticise and, you know, whatever the rights and wrongs of what the Tories have done, they have won three general elections in a row. So it can't be that wrong. I think well, it's four, actually, but... <laughs> sorry, four, it's in, four, in four in a row. Four. Yeah. yeah, I think, though, two... Two of those are probably because Jeremy Corbyn was in charge, right? Very possibly. Mm. Very possibly. But then, you know, Keir Starmer needs to show that he's not Jeremy Corbyn. Yeah, well, obviously. And, and again, you know, he's, he's only floating this idea. Let's see what he does with the, the two-child benefit cap. Mm. Specifically, Angela Rayner has been very, very um, vocal about her growing up on free school meals, she was a free school meals kid, etc. And now, um, and they've been really supportive of the Sunday Mails campaign for universal free school meals. But yet today, I think um, I read that he is now sort of backtracking or saying, you know, he can't commit to uh, bringing in the, the sort of scale of free school meals that they had been discussing before. Um, I don't know. I don't know what your views are on free school meals, Ben. But I just think there's a bit too many, um, you know, with this benefits policy and then the free school meal stuff. I just think they really risk sort of isolating their kind of core voters in a way. Yeah, I mean, just again, obviously, we're to to sort of come back to the Scottish angle. Mm. This, this is something that's devolved. So Kate Starmer can say, right, every school kid in the country has to pay 20 quid for the, the lunch from now on. Mm. And it, it won't affect Scottish schools. So yeah, in, in a way, this is a this is a policy that's a, I think probably Wales is the same. This is this is an English policy. It's for mm. English voters if if they if, if they like the idea of saving a bit of cash. And not funding, you know, wealthy kids in the home counties to go and get fish fingers, chips and beans every day. Then perhaps there are other things that can be uh, that, that, that this money can be spent on. Mm. Or perhaps it can go to some of the traditional labour um, constituencies in the north and in the inner cities, and in Wales and in Scotland, and you know, actually start doing some targeted good rather than just spraying it around every kid in the country. I, I, I don't know. I, 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 and, and as I say, it's, it, it doesn't affect Scotland. The, the Scottish government is in charge, lock, stock and barrel 
of mm. our overcrowded, underperforming schools and, um, <laughs> you know, Keir Starmer, Keir Starmer's policy is kind of irrelevant up here. Well, yeah, it is, but my point about it was, you know, if he starts throwing around these sorts of things, yeah, yeah, it, it's it going to get the impression that, oh, this isn't actually Labour. And even though, like, individual things like the school meal policy, yes, it's not applicable in Scotland, but it's still going to filter through to voters here, we think. Mm. It is, yeah. I, th I, think, I think the biggest danger of this for Labour is in Scotland because it's clearly a policy designed to win over soft Tory voters in England. Mm. And it's just going to turn off Labour voters in Scotland who, or SNP voters in Scotland who are maybe thinking, Do you know what, I might give Labour another try. And then they see stuff like this and they think, no, nah, I'm going to stick with the SNP because... Mm. So, so, you know, it's a tricky job. He's got to appeal to... Um, the whole of the United Kingdom, and it's, you know, we're a very diverse country. Voters in different places look for different things. They have different priorities. It, it, it's hard for Keir Starmer to, or Rishi Sunak, for that matter, to appeal to everyone. Mm. You know, this is, in a way, this is good that we've got shows like this that can remind people in Scotland that it doesn't matter what Keir Starmer says about school meals. It, it's... It, it's it, it's a Scottish government decision. Um, okay, let's uh, wrap it up. Um, good week, bad week. Starting with you, Hannah. Oh, my bad week. Yes, is just the 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 general place that is Westminster. Um, you know, we've had Mary Black being very honest and quite brutal about the place and how it operates. We've had Chris Pincher, who has been. Uh, well, he's not been sanctioned yet, but he's been found, you know, to have been uh, pinching pe people, <laughs> um, you know, kind of sleazy behaviour by Chris Pincher. And then we've had, you know, there's some some chat as well uh, earlier on in the week. The BBC did a good piece of work as well with some former staffers in Westminster who have been talking about kind of sleaze and inappropriate behaviour. And I just think, you know, all these things combined, it's just... Just leaves Westminster feeling a bit yuck, basically. Um, so that's my bad week, is just the, the institution of Westminster. Uh, and my good week is a bit of a sarcastic good week, but it's Lorna Slater, because for a change... Um, so because Parliament is not sitting. <laughs> well, yeah, essentially, yeah. Parliament is not sitting. She's not uh, been you know, called to give up her job uh, this week like she has been for the past four, five, six weeks. And instead, it's actually Patrick Harvey who's getting all the uh, dogs abuse <laughs> for the Green Party. So that's my my alternative good week is Lorna Slater. Well done, Lorna. Um, you finally received some praise from Planet Hollywood. Um, ben, how about <laughs> you? Good week, bad week? Uh, good week, Mary Black. Um, I think... Uh, you know, she's clearly a very intelligent woman. She's uh, recognised the direction of travel, even though her seat's probably one of the safer. You know, it's very much mid-table in terms of the, the, the Labour target seats in Scotland. Certainly winnable, but, you know, she, she had a good chance of defending it. But, she, you know, fair play to her. Like I said before, she's recognised the direction and, and she's jumped from the sinking ship. Not sure Stephen Flynn will be so happy appointing her as deputy, and uh, six months later she's she's announced she's leaving. Next steps, who knows? Thanks for the job. Uh, I'm off. Uh, uh, I'm a celebrity. Uh, Kezia Dugdale did it. I, I, I think Mary Black's got a big future. I think she's 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 recognised across the UK. She 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 has jumped beyond. The boundaries of, of Scottish politics and, and people across the country know her. I can see her on politics shows. I can see her having a career in the media. Alternatively, is it Mary Black v Kate Forbes for the next leader of the opposition after uh, the next Hollywood elections? Mm -hmm. Who knows? But but anyway, I think she's got out while the getting's good. And can you again, see her? So she's, she's quite a smart cookie. Can you see her going on Strictly, Ben? 
<laughs> I could. I, I absolutely could. Yeah, yeah. That, that, that's a good shout. I mean, I'd actually watch Strictly if Mary Black was yeah, on. Yeah, could you imagine? Hmm? I could imagine. Yeah. The, the, the suits are kind of already a bit Strictly, so mm -hmm. yeah. I, 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 honestly, I, I think she's, you know, I, I, she, she's got that kind of X factor that will take her beyond. Whether I mean I don't agree with the word she says, but um, Daily Express I, I, backs Mary Black for strictly. <laughs> for strictly. <laughs> and who's your who's your bad week, Ben? Bad week, uh, kind of the the other side of Hannah's coin. It's uh, Patrick Harvey. Um, you love while, this guy. You love Patrick, don't you? <laughs> while um, it, you know republicanism. And, and you know, being an anti-monarchist, it's a perfectly respectable, widely held view. I think he will have been very, very, very disappointed by the turnout at his rally. Um, Clyde Raid, we, we weren't there, but Clyde Radio had a reporter there who counted 50 people. I think the Press Association later suggested it was 100, either way, 50 to 100 people. To, to hear Patrick Harvey lambast the monarchy, I think he's. I think he'll be disappointed at that. I think it shows probably that he, he's, he's very much a, a lone voice when it comes to to this. That this forty percent of people who would rather have an elected head of state clearly don't care that much that they actually That's want to go and, and 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 make their voices heard. I think it's a shrug of the shoulders rather than anything else. So bad week for well, Patrick Harvey. One thing you can never accuse this uh, program of is in ignoring the Scottish Greens. We always <laughs> cover them every week. Um, they may not like the commentary, but at least they um, are discussed and talked about. So I think that brings the latest edition to a close. Thanks to the guests, Hannah Roger and Ben Borland, for, for joining us again. Um, uh, I'm not sure when the next Planet Holyrood uh, is going to take place. That's still to be discussed. But um, whenever it happens, we, we hope that you um, join us. So thanks again. Big up to it's important we look at the facts. Yeah. Why? Why? Douglas Ross is sounding pretty scared. I believe in independence. And he clapped like a seal.